Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Interior Design, The New Freedom. Today we'll be talking to one of the best known of contemporary designers, Angelo Dangia. He is a custom designer for the elite, a designer of furniture, sheets, wallpaper, and glassware for the mass market. Actually, you're a unique combination, I guess, that encompasses everything from wall coverings to celebrity interiors. What was it that attracted you initially to the world of design? Living more attractively, making the world a better place to live in, and knowing that when people feel more attractive, they just feel better. Well, in a sense, you are like some of the very best known of fashion designers, household words who design custom-made, in your instance, objects, and at the same time, make commercial products to be sold to a very wide audience. Thinking of that, in fact, looking at the way you are put together as well, did you ever consider going into fashion design? Well, as you may know, my father was a tailor, and uh, I grew up uh, with always a parental wish from, uh, from them, thinking that I would follow in his footsteps. Did that have any influence on your choice of a career? And the real question is, was how was your early interest in decoration nurtured? Well, I think just by looking, I think, yes, I can answer that directly. Kaufman's department store in Pittsburgh. It was the closest town that had anything of uh, the nature of a city to where I was born. And Kaufman's department store did beautiful windows and beautiful room settings, and I was attracted by that. And for some reason, I wanted to do that. And that was probably when I was about eight years old. And it's never changed, you see. And what made you decide, and when did you leave that small Pennsylvania town in which you grew up? I left uh, 1953, and at that time I was, I think, 18, and I never went back, except to visit relatives, of course. You left to come to school, and soon after school, as I recall, you started your interior design career, and that's, I guess, more than 20 years ago now, mm -hmm. as one of Yale Burge's assistants. How did you get that job, and what did you do there? I made a phone call to Yale Burge, to Billy Baldwin, and to Michael Greer. And in that order. And I called Yale first, he wasn't in, and his assistant was in, and I was interviewed. And I never forget, because I was dressed up in a Brooks Brothers suit, and uh, I had my button-down shirt, and my rep tie, and I looked very pro appropriate and thought somewhat like a banker or a college student. And I walked in, and they said, terrific. He said, you'll come back and see Mr. Burge in about a month. He's in Mexico. And so I got back exactly when they said to be there on the second. And Mr. Burge said, how do you do, young man? What would you like to do? And I said, I would love to work. And he said, how much do you want to make? And I said, well, I'd like $100 a week. He said, you'll take 75. I said, I sure will. <laughs> how important is formal training to the career of an interior designer? We're speaking of a very sensitive subject, and that's creativity. Um, I feel anyone, anyone in this space today, uh, is capable of doing what I do. You're capable of doing what I do. Some of us are born with less fences in the way of our abilities. And some of us are born with a lot of fences in the way of our abilities. And sometimes a school helps break down those fences. Um, I interview many people, and I have now over 75 people working for me. And in the design division, as I interview people, they always run to with me with their portfolio and tell me where they've been trained. I barely read the resume. I'm not interested. Most important thing to me is exactly what do you love? I want to know what they like. What impact and influence did working at Burge have on your own style and the way your own career evolved? He had a great effect on me. First, he was like a second father. He was a great businessman. My father was a great businessman. Burge was an enormous, he had an incredible integrity 
and was very kind to people. He was very kind to me. And I learned a lot from him. I didn't necessarily align my point of view with his. We were kind of separate. Although, while we worked together, I tried to include his point of view within mine. But as we grew further apart and he stepped away from the direction of the company and I took over, I began to blossom and began to formulate that which most people know, from, know me for today. And one of the things that you did, and I guess one of the things that you're best known for, is what makes your practice different from that of so many other interior designers, and that is the large-scale business and the expanding of your own design work. When and how did that begin to happen? What was the first of your ventures? Uh, again, back to Yale. Yale had another business. He had a reproduction French furniture business and an antique business and the interior design business. Now, I was a partner only in the interior design business. What he wanted was me to direct the company and make a profit. That was his goal. And to do it with the quality of integrity that he insisted on. Now, when he did that, um, I was certainly satisfied that he had his company, but I, I too had began to have my restlessness because I, I am a man who, who really likes to do many things. I can't do one thing and I like to wear many hats. So I met a young man who designed some fabrics and we developed a company called Vice Versa. Vice Versa is in existence today, um, not only on those designs, but on others. But that was my first project. Now I asked Yale to be involved in that and he said no. He said, look, do it yourself. It's yours and we'll now be balanced. I'll have my thing, you'll have your thing and we'll have our one thing together. What did you find lacking in existing either fabrics or furniture that made you, other than the fact that your friend came with a good idea, strike out on your own to manufacture fabrics? Well, I'm a gambler, you know. I uh, have a very free spirit and I believe in trying anything. I have a great belief in my ability, I have a great belief in myself and I feel, the, I always think of something my attorney always tells me, what is the worst thing that could happen? What is the worst thing that could happen if we got involved in X? And I always think of that. The worst thing that could happen, I'd fall on my tail and I'd get up again. How do you contrast the difference between decorator, space planner, or designer? How do you define what it is that you do, for example? Well, I am a decorator and I am a designer. Sometimes I decorate and sometimes I design. A lot of designers today want to be called interior designers only. And I find it very bad for our profession that they do that because I feel that, that what's the difference? You know, one designs in designing, one really takes care of the whole matter. The replanning uh, of space and conceptualizing. The, space is, the conceptualizing, exactly. And, and in decorating, you may do some surface decoration. I mean, we decorate just by what you've done on this stage today. Do you find that some of the people in your profession are defensive about the term decorator these days? Have you ever heard a mother say, my son the decorator? <laughs> don't think too many. <laughs> no. I don't think too many people. There's something about what's happened in our industry, and I am constantly out on the road talking to the various professional organizations. I speak to schools constantly trying to get my message across, and it is just upgrading the professionalism in our business. Um, by handling ourselves as professionals and not as business people. There is a difference. Now, I'm not saying the one can't be the other, but one has to be a professional first to be regarded as a professional, and then he's a businessman. Well, you are one of the people who's managed to be both a designer, decorator, and a businessman. I suspect, in fact, I think you were the very first designer, interior designer, to put your name on a mass-produced line. Was it the sheets? Yes. Yes, about when 10 was years ago. that? About 10 years ago. How'd that all come With, about? Uh, uh, someone from Bloomingdale's, a friend of mine at Bloomingdale's, uh, said, you should be designing sheets. And I said, I don't. You know, I mean, how do you do that? I mean, I'm an interior designer and I'm a decorator and I do all the things I do. He said, look, I have the power to do what I can do and I would like to speak to somebody, I'll call you. And in about two days, I had a call from J.P. Stevens. That was 10 years ago. I did my first collection then, 
my first sheet design was called Good Morning Glory. Flowers? Yes. And uh, then there was called uh, Tomorrow's Rainbow. And then I did my most famous sheet, uh, which was called Window Pane. And what have you learned from the J.P. Stevens operation that you apply to your own design business? Uh, learning that you, you need organization at all times in order to get your product out. That you must have the perfect management set up in order to produce properly and in order to com complete your commitments. Well, you have designed a great number of things, and as I mentioned earlier, they are sheets and towels yes. and tablecloths and designer rugs and wallpaper and, of course, beautiful chairs like the ones we're sitting on like and the this. ones that uh, are on the other part of this stage with us, these beautiful glasses, uh -huh. the two gla drinking glasses, china, giftware. Among all of those things, what do you consider to be your most important product? Furniture. Furniture is my first love, and I'll tell you um, probably the reason for that. It might be that little hidden command way in the background of being a tailor, because it's the closest thing in the interior design business that comes to tailoring. You see, this chair has, has certainly tailoring, and it has seeming. I wonder if you could point to any one or two or several things that you might describe as a key to the whole thing. Was there a critical period for you when it all came together? I think the turning point in my whole career was when I was asked to do the Metropolitan Opera Club. Billy Baldwin called me and, and said, you know, would you be interested in doing that room? And of course, Billy was always my great idol. And I had always looked up to Billy. And for him to recognize me at that stage of my life. Um, and he was responsible for the Metropolitan Opera Club. The Guild. The Guild, the guild and, room. And you did and the I club room. I did the room. Opera Club across the way. And he said, well, I will have the committee contact you. Well, about two days later, about 15 limousines rolled up in front of my office. At least it seemed like and 15. And out came all of these very <laughs> fancy benefactors who the opera. And they walked in. I was very impressed with myself, I have to tell you. And I saw them all. They came in and they wanted Angelo Dungi. And I couldn't believe it. I had only been decorating for seven years. And uh, it was a very important point. Mr. Burge himself was extremely impressed. And it was kind of a charity event and, and, and not. And it's something I learned from Yale Burge that day. And I went in and I said, Yale, yeah, look, we're going to be able to do the Opera Club. And aren't you excited? And, and what a prestigious job. And he said, uh, yes, it's wonderful. Because you know, he realized how supportive. much it was going to cost him. Very supportive. And he said, now, uh, how are you working this? And I said, well, we'll just you know, give them everything it costs, and, and we'll provide all the drawings, and we'll supervise the installation, and we'll do a normal decorating job. He said, that's fine. He says, but Angelo, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You have a very good business mind of your own. But I'm going to make a suggestion. I think you should charge them. <laughs> Did you? And I said, but Yale. He says, mm-mm. They will think more of you if you do. And I went into that meeting and I felt, oh my God, how can I do that? I was so impressed with getting the job that I was forgetting why I was doing it and why I was in this business. And so I said that you will have to pay the fee. And they said, fine. How do you apply that to your private clients, for example? I do nothing for nothing. One of the diseases of our profession is it it's very social. And you have a tendency to become social with clients. Remember, you're doing their bathrooms and their bedrooms, and nothing is more personal. Um, I feel that I keep away from any socializing with any clients. I make it my practice to not have dinner with them and to not have lunch with them. I could count on these two hands when I've had lunch or dinner with clients in the 20 or so years. And I have decided that that is the best policy. Keep it on a business level. Obviously, there is a very special link that 
you and whomever it is, for whomever it is that you are decorating an interior. How do you establish that kind of rapport and how do you keep them, in a sense, feeling that they are getting enough attention, particularly when their friends have just come from a cocktail party or having as next weekend's house guest or whatever, the person who is doing their interior? By just delivering. I deliver. I give them what they've come for. I'm not interested in becoming their friends. I have nothing against them. I mean, there are a lot of people that I have worked with that I would like to have as friends. And after their jobs have finished, I have become friends. But I'm speaking during the process. Um, it's very important to keep arm's length so that the respect there is on a business level and on a professional level. I mean, you would not go out and have cocktails with your doctor, you know. Um, it's very important that they take what I'm saying as being a business arrangement and not something that becomes a friendly conversation. Um, but I deliver what they, they have come there for and I have satisfied many people and I call them every day. You know, I have a, a habit, and not a habit, but a, just a process that I use in my business and I try to train the people who work with me to always answer their phone calls. They are never to leave a phone call unanswered by the end of the day. And they're not to leave, even if it's midnight, until they answered that call. And they are to call each client that they have once a day in order to let them know that they are being handled. The trouble starts when a client feels like he's not being handled and is not getting his money's worth. How do your clients feel about do they ever object to the commercial availability of certain Dongi designs? Because there are a number of things that you have designed on a custom-made level that are also mass market wares. Certainly, uh, some of the furnishings. Uh, yes, uh, I had that fear. A lot of people who advised me had that fear. And they thought, well, if you start getting into the mass market, the people with a lot of money and who want prestigious goods are not going to come to you and so forth. But the opposite has happened. My business has tripled because of it. You see, yes, someone might not come, but all those who didn't ever hear of you would come. I guess one of your most ambitious and unusual projects to date has been the total redesign of a very grand luxury liner the SS Norway. Wasn't that formerly the SS France? SS France. Well, it is now a Caribbean cruise ship. Mm -hmm. And you were responsible for not only each stateroom, but the dining room, the disco, the cabaret, every table, every table lamp. How large is that ship and what did you do? It's three football fields long, nine, almost thousand feet. It has 1,000 staterooms and 26 public rooms, three swimming pools, a gymnasium, a theater, and endless miles of corridors. Was there an organizing theme, color, principle that you used, uh, particularly when something is named the SS Norway, something, at least to me, is summoned to mind. I can't picture um, something that looks like Brazil well, in a ship called the Norway. All due respect to Norway, it's a lovely country. It does not exude style. It does not exude, you wouldn't think of it as a place to be inspired by color. Um, and it was difficult, but I had to remember that the ship was in the Caribbean. It was going to be with people with bathing suits and, and uh, shorts and white clothes and perhaps evening clothes. So it was designed as a background for that activity against the color backdrop of the Caribbean the blue of the water, the sky, the green of the trees, the white of the sand. What are the, the colors breeze. that you used? Very soft pastels, uh, dusty pastels, like salmons and turquoise, with a basis. And these were colors that seemed to be very appropriate for that background, and specially constructed fabrics for the, uh, for the ship called chenille, a cotton chenille instead of wool. You know, most contract fabrics and public chair fabrics are done in wool. And I couldn't imagine sitting in a very thin, mm -hmm. a woman sitting in a thin dress or a man sitting in shorts on woolen fabrics. So we developed a special chenille weave that was appropriate and fit all standards. And it was really quite an exciting thing to do. Well, you can imagine people sitting on wool or at least surrounded by it in lots of the other interiors that you do. 
I think it would be fair to say that one of your trademarks is the men's suiting fabric, the gray flannel, that covers walls in many of the interiors that you do. In fact, it lines your very own office. By now, I think we can suspect how that use originated. Um, does it relate to that tailoring background? Well, I never thought of it that way, but it could. It could, I, and gray flannel has always been one of my own favorite suitings that I wear a lot of. And about 10 years ago, I was in a gray flannel suit and we were redoing the offices and I said, golly, I, I just can't think of what we have to do to these walls. I don't want them white. I don't want them beige. I don't want to cover them in sailcloth. And I looked at my suit and I said, well, gray flannel, what could be more neutral than silver gray? How long ago did you do that? I mean, 10 years ago. Are there any other personal trademarks that we should know about? Fat furniture. People always call me the maker of fat furniture. I was, I was named fat that furniture? by someone from the New York Times who was interviewing me once, and uh, she said, well, you know, why do you do fat furniture? And I couldn't think of anything to say. And I said, well, it makes fat person, persons look skinny. I've been thinking about what you said about fat furniture for several reasons, obviously, and I think what it means, at least to me, is that your furniture has a certain voluptuous quality to it. It's kind of soft and warm, and sometimes I think it has a kind of billowing, billowy modernism without any of the hard edges. Is that a fair way to describe it? I think it's sensual. Sexy, if you may. And is that your intent? It's what comes out, you know? It's what I do. It's my Italian part of it. Sounds pretty good. What are the most neglected parts of the decorating process? Ceilings. Did you ever walk into a public room or into anybody's house and look at the ceiling? I often do to think of the afterthought do that you know is up there. That most designers think that nobody ever looks up. Therefore, put anything that you don't know what to do with on the ceiling. And what do you do about ceilings? I consider ceilings, I learned that at Parsons. That was my biggest lesson. <coughs> ceilings, when you study traditional design, and you study periods, and you study architecture of past periods, you sense that the ceiling has been given the same amount of consideration as the wall and as the floor. And if I always think of a room, most rooms, as a six-sided box, if not all surfaces are given the same amount of attention and love, you have a problem. How do you make a ceiling look higher? How do you brighten a dark room? Or how do you make a boring box the sort of thing that so many of us are either surrounded by or forced to live in into an interesting space? Ceilings should always be higher. And in order to have ceilings look higher, it is always best to have the ceiling the same color as the wall. The deeper the contrast, the more the eye will define its height. So in order to keep your attention off the low ceiling, if you diminish the demarcation between ceiling and wall, it will appear higher. And do the same thing with the woodwork as well? That's correct. And you create as many vertical lines as you can, which is an old design rule that goes back with the Egyptians. Not everyone is a corporate executive, a Barbara Walters, a Ralph Lauren, a Diana Ross, a Halston, some of your clients. I wonder if you still have the time, or your office does, to deal with a client on a small budget. No. I would like to help everyone. Uh, but I have a lot of people working for me, and I have my own survival to think about. I have the survival of all my people who work for me to think about. It is not good business sense for a company who is set up to do large jobs to do small jobs, because it takes about, it takes more time to do the small jobs than it does to do the big jobs, you see. And the kind of time that you'd have to put in with handling people who would like to have your services, there would be no profit and eventually no business. You offer people financial arrangements that I think are different than most decorators, particularly on the scale and with the amount of budget that you deal with. I feel more comfortable when I'm given options, and therefore I feel that giving options to others works very well. I don't do it any other way, and this is my fee, and that's that. Fine. 
But that's not the only way that one can make what he would have made. There are many ways. So I've developed three different methods. One, by doing purchases and collecting the difference between a wholesale and retail. Two, by charging fees, flat, fixed fees, or a combination of the two. And finally, an hourly charge, starting with perhaps a couple of hundred dollars an hour for my services. And these are all carefully worked out arrangements in advance. Yes, and they're all contractual, large upfront payments. Businessmen prefer that. <coughs> Businessmen that I work with say, I don't believe that you're really giving me the opportunity because now I can, because you see, one of the greatest problems, one of the other greatest problems of the interior design business is that people always feel like there's something hidden. Something's going on that's hidden. Is there often something going on that's hidden? Did you ever see a lot of decorators in a, in a, in a, um, a showroom <laughs> going, is it List or Net? <laughs> you know, the List or Net. Yes, they and create all these secrets. I understood what that all meant anyway. Well, that's it. And, and probably you're wondering, what are they doing? Are they making money on the side? Are they making a deal? Could I get it cheaper somewhere else? And they're trying to sell me a whole bundle of goods just to make a profit? That is riddled in our business and basically has put a complete damper. It has totally suppressed our business. What should happen is we should be upfront as designers and we should say to that customer, I would like a hundred thousand dollar fee to do your house. Because in a lot of cases, that's what they are getting for doing the house on a sale of merchandise basis. Now, if that is the case, I feel that people should be saying to that person, I'm worth a hundred thousand dollars. I am. They would have more respect and the mystery would disappear and the elevation of our professional status in this community would be better. Well, thank you, Angelo Dangia, for doing a great deal toward that end, for telling us about the art of your business and for sharing your life and your work with us in such a generous way. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Interior Design, The New Freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much.